Okay, so good morning or afternoon, uh, as the case may be, depending on when you are tuning in to this The Cotton Companion podcast. We want to welcome you, welcome you back uh, to the to our world famous podcast uh, from wherever it is that you may be tuning in today uh, in the U.S. Cotton Belt, from Moultrie to Maricopa, Arizona, and all points in between. We welcome you. Uh, today is Thursday, September 21, and we are trying to slip into some some fall weather here in Memphis. I think the 21st is the fall equinox or something like that. I don't know. Solstice. Is it solstice? It, it depends on if you're in areas where you actually have four seasons yeah, right. or not. Right. Well, the, and I'm not sure I'm not sure the Mid-South counts. That's what I was I was uh, I was working my way towards that. Although my car gauge, my little temperature gauge in my car this morning did say 75 degrees as I was driving in. Uh, so that was encouraging. I know that many of our listeners uh, out there, especially in this part of the world in the Mid-South, would like to see more heat units this time of year because we did have a little bit of a mild August. Um, but for good and selfish reasons, I'm, I'm done with the heat units just, <laughs> just for today uh, as we experience a little bit of pleasant weather, at least in the morning time. How about humidity? Have you had it with humidity yet? Yeah, yeah, I had a little, yeah just yesterday, actually. <laughs> uh, it was good and hot out. So my name is Beck Barnes. Uh, if y'all don't know, I am the publisher and editor here at Cotton Grower Magazine, and I am here with the magazine's senior editor, Mr. Jim Stebman. Hello, Jim. Hello, Beck. Hello, listeners. Welcome back. Yeah, we are uh, we are a little behind in getting back to these guys uh, here on the Cotton Companion Podcast. It was a busy, uh, busy sort of late August and early September, so forgive us for being behind on our podcast. And I know that a lot has happened since we last checked in uh, with our listeners, I mean, we've had uh, Hurricane, uh, Hurricane Harvey rather blasted uh, our readerships, uh, cotton producers, dear friends down there in the Gulf Coast region of Texas, especially I think they're south of Corpus. They probably got the worst of it. Saw some uh, pictures that we hated to see, bowls blown out across, the, or rather uh, bales blown out across the fields and things like that. So we, we, we hated to see that. Uh, not more recently, uh, we, of course, had Hurricane Irma that uh, attacked the southeast. I know down there in South Georgia they had a lot of damage. And then, uh, unfortunately, we've also seen stories coming out of the high plains uh, of some of these very damaging hailstorms over the past, I don't know, two, three weeks that we saw. Um, some of those stories that we hated to see. And so first off, we want to say, you know, all of y'all are in our thoughts and in our prayers uh, here in Memphis, especially those of y'all who were hit hardest by some of this uh, terrible weather we've seen uh, this sort of autumn season. Um, Second thing I would like to say about that is, you know, as we are trying to get a gauge on uh, what has gone on with these storms and we are trying to chronicle your stories you know, it's it's one thing for me to sit there and, and try to read other folks' reports from here in Memphis. I can't get to all the damage areas. I want to encourage y'all if you have a um, experienced, uh, if you've experienced any or suffered any damage due to one of these devastating s- storms, uh, please shoot me an email and give me a summary of your experience. You know, we are trying to be uh, chronicle uh, these these events as they happen too. I mean, we are a farm media. Uh, publication first and foremost so we need to hear from you we need to hear from first-hand sources so if you have been affected by any of these storms please reach out to me my email is b barnes so that's b b a r n e s at meistermedia.com m e i s t e r media.com uh, and tell me a little bit about your experience as uh, we try to get a better grip on what our readership is going through out there. So that's the last I'll say about that. I'll plug my, rarely do a sort of editorial plug on the podcast, but I need to hear from y'all on this stuff. So anyhow, we know that uh, those of y'all who have been unaffected mercifully by any of these uh, bad storms are out there. You you guys are harvesting or getting ready to harvest. Uh, We certainly hope that that's going smoothly this harvest season, and we hope that you're starting to see some big numbers on those yield monitors. Uh, We are going to start today's podcast, as we always do, with uh, Jim here leading us in a discussion of some of the hot-button hard news from around the cotton industry. Uh, He's got a bunch he passed along to me and told me he was going to be talking about today. 
uh, sampling of that that he will be touching on include, uh, of course, a crop progress report, uh, a discussion on some of this storm damage that he has been reading up on and sort of, I think he said some brief takeaways of that stuff. Uh, U.S. cotton sustainability goals, uh, story that, that we came across our desk this week. Uh, some precision slash equipment uh, industry news with deer buying Blue River, <coughs> which some of you guys were familiar with Blue River because I've spoken with a lot of y'all out there that kind of looking forward to this technology that Blue River was bringing into the cotton market. So Jim's going to touch on that. We had some news from Dow about Enlist One and Elevor that came out this week that we want to tell y'all about, <clears throat> and has bec- and what has become a common theme on the Cotton Companion podcast. We are going to talk about. We're going to give you a dicamba update, uh, particularly with some news that came out of a, uh, the Ar- an Arkansas task force. We got something on a grower petition, some EPA considerations, a lot of things sort of breaking on that front, and. Uh, uh, sort of a, to dovetail or to put a nice bow on that conversation, we also have a great interview with Dr. Larry Steckel, Tennessee Extension Weed, weed Specialist, specialist yes. um, who's going to tell us about, he's sort of right here at the epicenter of this dicamba thing here uh, in West Tennessee where we are as well. So um, he's going to talk about his experiences that he's seen this growing season. I want to make a quick note. One thing that you do not see in Jim's uh, sort of roster of topics he's going to touch on in a minute are the WISD reports. Um, you know, we I have been sort of making mention, I'm sure all of y'all have too, that USDA has been tossing out these huge projected production numbers for next season. And Jim, I think you were telling me that you don't think that they are there. They haven't taken into consideration these hurricanes at all, have they? The impression we've been getting from, from some of our economist friends, uh, just real quickly, the sept- the August report, USDA said we're doing, going to do 20 million bales this year. Yeah. Uh, then the hurricane came through, Harvey came in, and everybody was expecting the September numbers to be down a little bit. Well, instead, September numbers added another 1.2 million bales. So now we're sitting at 21.2 million bales of production for this year. Uh, I think most of the people that we talk to, of course, it's it's causing the market to go up, down, up, down. And, uh, you know, some of the price ranges, uh, I believe I've seen range anywhere from 62 cents up to 71 cents. And that's a huge range at this point. Uh, I think people are basically hoping that there's some stability uh, that comes out with the October report where finally, uh, be able to get in and, and look at a more realistic view following some of the losses from uh, from Harvey and from Irma and keeping our fingers crossed that something else doesn't come churning out of the Atlantic to uh, to mess things up at harvest. Yeah, so so I just wanted to make a note there. Jim was telling me about this before we got started here. If I know some of y'all uh, look forward to Jim's sort of WASD and uh, uh, sort of market-related update. I am such a knowledgeable accountant. Or, or <laughs> economist, is. yes. You, you are the cotton grower. Uh, <laughs> that's, your, that's your beat. I have you're, enough trouble balancing a checkbook. You so. are the expert at, amongst the, the two-man show here. So <laughs> that's that's one of the many hats that Jim wears around here. Um, so we don't want to put the cart before the horse. We're going to take a brief break. And when we come back on the flip side of this thing, Jim will dive into each of those topics. Um, Before we do that, though, I want to give you a quick reminder. You could do us a great favor by visiting cottongrower.com slash subscribe and go ahead and resubscribe yourself to our magazine or our weekly e-newsletter of both of those items. And um, you, again, you would be doing Cotton Grower Magazine a great favor if you value the content that we provide. Um you could help us out in turn by just giving us your uh, email address or your physical address so that we can continue sending you issues of the magazine. Okay, that's it for now. Stick with us through this music break, and we will be right back. Welcome back to the Cotton Companion. Uh, as Beck said, we're going to run through some news items from the cotton industry that have uh, that have occurred here over the last couple of weeks. Uh, and we're going to go through them rather quickly because uh, I believe there's everybody's busy. There are more important things to do, and uh, it's just sort of a, a quick highlight of, of things that are, are going on while we're all staying busy in other other areas. Uh, we're going to start with the latest crop progress report out of USDA. This would be the report for the week ending. 
September 17th. Uh, and as we go through the season, the number of, uh, of reports that you get uh, start dropping. So we're down to uh, Cotton Bowl's opening. Uh, we're looking at, uh, as of this week, 44% of the U.S. crop is showing open bowls. That's a 10% increase over the, in, over the, the, the week ending September 10th. Uh, and when you look at all the cotton producing states, all but four of those states showed double digit increases in bowl opens uh, here over the past week. So we and certainly anticipate that that number were going to uh, going to get much higher as the, the new report comes out uh, next week. On harvested numbers, uh, we're still relatively low and that's expected at this point. Only 11% of the crop has been harvested. Uh, that's a 2% jump in, in the past week. The majority of those harvested acres came out of Texas, which would be in that South Texas Coastal Bend area, which unfortunately uh, took part of the uh, part of Harvey's wrath, uh, and Arizona, uh, where the crop is uh, is also coming out of the ground or coming out of the field at this point. Uh, other than that, there's very little activity in harvest. Uh, so again, we'll keep an eye on that over the next couple of weeks as we see those numbers start ratcheting up. Cotton condition. Uh, we're starting to see a little bit of, of indication from some of the storms, but again, very little change in the way that it, it looks out for, uh, uh, for, again, for this past week, you're still looking at 61% of the crop is either rated good to excellent, 25% uh, of the crop is rated fair. Uh, it's the poor to very poor numbers that took a little jump this past week and are now up to 14%. So uh, again, we'll keep an eye on that as we move, uh, move ahead into harvest season and see how, this, uh, how this, whole, this whole season works out for us. Uh, we've had a little discussion already about the hurricanes and I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of, uh, of detail there because I think everybody's probably tired of, uh, of hearing about it. And, uh, but basically just some preliminary numbers that we have seen uh, out, of, uh, out of Texas uh, after Harvey uh, basically seeing that uh, harvest activities were roughly 40% complete leading up to uh, the time Harvey came on shore uh, with another estimated 300,000 300, to 400,000 bales of cotton still on the stalk. Uh, as we've moved ahead here over the last week or so, uh, we're starting to see some overall estimates anticipated now at roughly 800,000 bales lost in that coastal Texas area. Uh, in Georgia, uh, as Irma came up, uh, came up the, the Florida coast and into, uh, into South Georgia, some preliminary numbers by some of the economists and specialists over there at this point. Uh, thankfully, there, there wasn't a whole lot of open cotton, so you know, they, they dodged that bullet. Um, but they did have a really good bowl load going in, in the field, and the crop was looking really good. Right now they're looking at field damage. Of course the fields are all twisted and, and you've got plants laying down. Hopefully most of them will stand back up uh, in time for harvest, but right now they're anticipating they've lost 10% of their uh, potential, potential production this year, uh, which could pencil out to about a hundred million dollar loss. Uh, again, uh, we haven't put, a, uh, haven't put a picker in the field out there yet, so we'll see how, how things work uh, and hold off. And, Hopefully we get no more storms in that area. And as, as Beck mentioned, uh, some of the, uh, what they call calling macro burst storms that have been rolling through the high plains here over the past, uh, over the past seven days. Uh, one went through a, a, a band that stretched from, uh, from Bailey County, which is over on the New Mexico border, uh, straight across a path that, that almost was directly between uh, Lubbock and uh, to the south and Plainview to the north, uh, some significant hail damage in fields, not just to fields, but also to equipment, also to houses, also to, to other structures and things like that. So it's, uh, it's always the worst time of year for something like this to happen. And, uh, and, and again, we are keeping our fingers crossed that this is the end of severe weather uh, and uh, that everybody will be able to move ahead and and have a, uh, a successful end of the year. One of the things that, uh, one, of the, one of the terms that's been popping up in the cotton industry quite a bit over the last couple of years is sustainability. And uh, basically, 
how do you make the world a better place for future generations? Uh, what's the cotton industry going to do to uh, improve its environmental footprint? Things like that. And these are, these are questions that we're getting not only within the industry, but certainly from people who buy cotton uh, for the industry, people in the, uh, in the clothing lines, people in, uh, yeah, who, are, who are looking to, uh, they want to be sure that we have measurable improvements in things like environmental stewardship, farm productivity, uh, land, water, air, input, and energy use. We want to be just as efficient as possible. Uh, this week, there was a report was issued by the uh, National Cotton Council's Cotton USA Sustainability Task Force. Uh, this task force was, uh, was created to, uh, to develop some industry-wide goals to help meet some of those requirements. And, uh, and improvements that, uh, that people are looking for from the cotton industry. And they, they spelled out uh, several goals here that they would like to see met uh, by 2025. Now again, this is taking into consideration that over the past 30 years, uh, the cotton industry has done an awful lot to help improve its, uh, its sustainability and its environmental footprint. But by 2025, here are the things that they, they're wanting to do, wanting to see in the industry. Uh, number one, they want to reduce by 13% the amount of land needed to produce a pound of cotton fiber. Second, reduce soil loss by 50% in balance with new soil formation. Want to increase water use efficiency, basically more fiber per gallon, by 18%. Reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 39% increase soil carbon in fields by 30 percent and reduce the energy needed to produce cottonseed and ginned lint by 15 percent. Uh, basically uh, they're, they're, they're lofty goals. Uh, I th obviously I think they're going to be attainable uh, otherwise the task force wouldn't put anything in, uh, in writing if, uh, if they didn't think it was we had an, uh, an opportunity for success in this. So again, this is, uh, the goals are meant to continue the trend that we've seen over the last 30 years. And uh, as they say, to re reinvigorate efforts through the setting of some realistic targeted reductions. This is one of the first times you've seen some specific percentages put in place uh, as far as, as sustainability goals. Almost on the heels of that, or, or, or right at about the same time, uh, Cotton Incorporated, who has been working uh, diligently in a lot of sustainability efforts over the last few years. Uh, this week named Dr. Jesse Daystar as their Vice President and Chief Sustainability Officer for Cotton Incorporated. Uh, he has worked with Cotton Incorporated in an advisory capacity for, you know, off and on for, for uh, some time uh, and is now joining the, uh, the organization as their first Chief Sustainability Officer. Uh, he comes from the Duke Center for Sustainability and Commerce at Duke University, where he was assistant director and was also on the faculty. He is, uh, has a, a, a deep background in the, uh, in the complexities of sustainability research, particularly as it relates to cellulosic fibers like cotton. So uh, we're, uh, sustainability seems to be the, uh, the key word right now as we're moving ahead, uh, as we're finishing up this year and moving ahead. Uh, in another related note, there is a, uh, as, as we speak, there's a group of textile manufacturers from, uh, I want to say 15 different countries that are touring the U.S. cotton belt to, uh, to see, to see how cotton is grown in the U.S., how it is harvested, how it is handled, how it is ginned, uh, to get a better feel for, uh, you know, for the, 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 the value that they're getting from uh, from U.S. cotton, so we've got a lot of a lot of efforts going on at almost simultaneously at this point to uh, to keep U.S. cotton uh, cotton's reputation U.S. cotton's reputation as a as a high quality product, high quality supplier, uh, very very visible to some of our customers in other parts of the world. Just uh, now, just a couple of uh, of quick company reports. Uh, Beck mentioned that uh, the uh, that that Deer and Company 
has signed a definitive agreement to acquire Blue River Technology out of, uh, out of Sunnyvale, California. Uh, Blue River is a, uh, has sort of been an innovation leader in trying to apply machine learning to agriculture. Uh, but Deere has, uh, I guess, has seen enough uh, and has been impressed enough with their technology to invest $305 million into uh, acquiring the company. Yeah, but before we just skirt past that phrase that Stedman <laughs> used, machine learning, meaning that the actual machine is learning as it goes. You heard it from Beck Barnes first. This is how Terminator starts with deer buying Blue River with these machines. <laughs> these machines they've got. Um, I'm joking, obviously, but the, but the, the they may speak in an Arnold Schwarzenegger type they, voice by the time this is all done. Eventually, you never know. they will. Yes. yes. But the, you guys are aware, and, and I may be stepping on your toes here, but but the Blue River uh, machine that they have is basically like a hooded applicator that is able to see. Uh-huh. I'm guessing partially using I don't know HDVI or something as it's going skirting across that field. The idea is that it's able to differentiate between a cotton plant and a weed and make an application on the weed as it's going across. Right. Am I right? Right. In some in some cases, they're 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 saying now now whether this will act actually become true or not. We'll see as as we get into development. A possibility of reducing herbicide applications and herbicide costs, you know, up to ninety percent. Yeah. Uh, simply because you're going across the field, it is uh, the algorithms and all the other technology, technical terms that are way above my head uh, in this piece of equipment. Uh, literally, should be able to or will be able to make the difference, as you said, you know, determine the difference between what's a weed and what's a plant. Yeah. Uh, it's variable rate. Right. Highly to to its highest degree. But, and the know. other the other factor in all this too, this is, the piece of equipment is called the sea and spray. Um, and cotton is the crop that they have tested. Uh, they're bringing it to the f- uh, before they look at, at other crops other than maybe some specialty crops in California. Um, basically it is, uh, we, we know it has been tested in Arkansas. Uh, Dr. Tom Barber there has been involved with some of the testing and uh, I talked with him there'll be an article in our uh, our October issue uh, about some of his experiences with the equipment Uh, they have also tested it on a larger scale out in the Lubbock area Uh, everywhere they have they've taken this piece of equipment people who who are a little skeptical about it from the beginning walk away very very impressed uh, I think one of the one of the comments that uh, that Dr. Barber said is, is, I was much much more impressed with it than I expected to be. Uh, so it uh, the other factor in all this is yes, even though we're talking about we have glyphosate, we have uh, dicamba products, we have uh, glufosinate, and products that are are approved right now for over the top use in cotton. Uh, this technology has the opportunity to bring back some non-selective products. I think one of the uh, one of the product mixes that they were using under the hoods uh, in some of the testing was gramoxone and caparol. Uh, get that on a cotton plant, and it's going to do some damage. Uh, they were able to avoid uh, a great deal of infield damage just by uh, by by spot spraying. Where they saw, where the machine saw weeds. So there's a there's a lot of potential, a lot of exciting potential in this, and I think it's one of the reasons the folks at Deer moved ahead to uh, to acquire this technology. Uh, they are already Deer was already working. They have an artificial intelligence center, a technology center in uh, in the San Francisco area. That I'm shaking my head. I know, I know. Beck is sitting here. He's all he's seeing is you know doom and destruction coming. T three. T three. I'm picturing the T three Terminator. <laughs> okay. If he can terminate weeds, we'll be good. There you go. There you go. That's fair. Uh, so uh, it's it's an exciting time. There are a lot of things happening on the precision front in cotton. Uh, we're gonna we're covering them as best we can at this point because a lot of them are still you know five ten years away, but. Uh, but it's an exciting time, and hopefully, we'll provide some additional solutions to some of the uh, the infield problems that uh, that we're struggling with. Um, from a herbicide perspective, Dow Agri Sciences 
introduced, uh, has announced here over the last couple of weeks uh, two herbicide innovations. Uh, the first one is uh, they are adding a, a product called Enlist One, uh, which is a straight goods 2,4-D choline uh, product that features their Colex D technology. It's the same product, the same technology that was in, that is in Enlist Duo. Uh, Enlist Duo is is uh, is a blend of this 2,4-D and glyph and glyphosate. Enlist One is the strict straight goods 2,4-D that that will allow growers to give them basically the ability to tank mix this product with uh, with glufosinate or a number of other tank mix partners based on the weed spectrum and the and the needs they have in their individual fields. So uh, what it, uh, it it brings a, another another level of choice and selectivity to uh, to the enlist system. Uh, the Enlist One has got, already received federal registration for use in uh, in 34 uh, states that grow cotton, corn, and soybeans. So uh, something else to uh, to consider for your toolbox as you move into 2018. Uh, several weeks ago, they also announced that they'd receive federal registration for Elevore herbicide, uh, which will be used in fall and spring burn down programs for cotton, soybeans, and corn. Uh, uh, I think the primary targeted weeds on this, uh, broadleaf weeds such as glyphosate and ALS resistant mare's tail, lamb's quarter, uh, cutleaf evening primrose, which is one that we, we see a lot in cotton. <laughs> and I'm looking at your face going, I've never heard of it before. It's a new one on me. <laughs> Inhibit. I'm sure some of our listeners know oh, about it. I guarantee it, it yeah. yeah. Uh, the key is, it is uh, it's an active ingredient. It translocates through the plant. Uh, the weed for, for effective control uh, helps prevent regrowth, and its its use rate is uh, is only one ounce per acre. So again, another tool to uh, to consider as we move into uh, into burn down season, both both this fall and in spring. And for the, all of you out there who carry cameras in your uh, in your tractors and, and in your pickers or strippers, uh, the cotton board is looking for photos. Uh, every year, the Cotton Board does uh, puts together a uh, an industry calendar uh, with some of, with twelve of the best cotton photos uh, throughout from the industry uh, on this, and uh, they have a contest going at this point uh, to look for one fin- one winning photo from from growers or people outside that are not professional photographers to add to the calendar uh, to be eligible to win. Uh, you have to go to the Cotton Board's Facebook page and like the Facebook page. Then email a high-res photo to, uh, to Stacy Gorman at the Cotton Board. Uh, you can submit up to three entries per contestant. This contest ends October 6th. Uh, the Cotton Board staff will uh, determine the winning photo and the winner. Obviously, the photo along with the photo credit will be included in that 2018 calendar. And there's also prizes involved for the winter, uh, cotton-related prizes, naturally, at this point. All of this information you can find on our website at cottongrower.com right now with the, uh, the specifics and the links to the Facebook page and also the, uh, the information on how to reach, uh, reach Stacy by email. So uh, get those cameras warmed up, go back through your files from the year, uh, see if you've got anything good that you'd like, uh, like to submit, and, uh, and go for it. Very cool. Yeah, I'm gonna have to upgrade. I'm sitting here thinking that I'm gonna have to upgrade my phone because that's about the only camera I can <laughs> I can really operate these days. If, I, if I'm going to enter, if you're listening, Stacy Gorman, I will have a a better phone this year to uh, to enter this thing. Absolutely. And let's end this segment with with sort of our you know our the, the continuing saga of uh, of dicamba in cotton. Uh, we're not going to go into it in a lot of detail because really and truly application season is over. We're now in the, in the position where you're kind of waiting to see uh, the extent of the damage and, uh, and and what kind of impact it's going to have on yields on some of the infected, affected crops. Uh, I'd say it's safe to say at this point most of the activity has been uh, still in Arkansas and Missouri. Uh, where the state plant board and other regulators, state regulators, have been uh, have been tossing out 
the date of April 15th as a cutoff for use of dicamba in crop in both of those states. Uh, Monsanto and the other manufacturers uh, are basically providing additional information saying that, uh, again, when applied properly, uh, there should not be a problem. Uh, I think there's, there's obviously, a, a, there's obviously a, a, a disagreement in opinion at this point between, uh, between the companies. But, you know, the, the big factor will be what's EPA going to do on it. Uh, got a, uh, saw a report this morning, so this is hot news. You see how I'm, how I'm holding this, shifting it from hand to hand yep. because it's, it's so hot. It's got a heat to it. Yep, it's got some heat to it. <laughs> Uh, but a report from Reuters News Service basically saying uh, that EPA is wanting to allow farmers to spray dicamba next year, uh, but add some additional rules for its use. I don't think that should come as a surprise. Uh, a gentleman named Reuben Barris, who is the acting chief of the herbicide branch of the EPA Office of Pesticide Programs, said the agency right now has not determined what steps it would take to mitigate problems associated with dicamba. They have been talking with state regulators about ways to prevent crop damage. Uh, obviously, they are very concerned with what occurred and happened this year, uh, but as Barris says, we're committed to taking appropriate action for the 2018 growing season with an eye toward ensuring that the technology is available to growers, but also that it is used responsibly. So uh, they are currently negotiating or are in, in discussions with Monsanto and BASF uh, to make changes regarding how those products are used. Uh, when you look at the possibility of an April 15th deadline uh, that Arkansas and Missouri have, have thrown out there, uh, at this point there's some, some speculation from other states of agri other state departments of agriculture that that early cutoff date is not going to match EPA's goal for maintaining uh, the dicamba usefulness in crop. Uh, it's a kind of restriction that uh, they're probably not going to consider uh, if they want to make sure that the crop, that the product is available for next year. So uh, a lot of discussion going on at this point from at the governmental and state levels. Uh, I am sure that uh, people will, uh, will will be able to, people smarter and, and at a higher pay level than, than us, will be able to, uh, to put some you know, bring some sense and some uh, some responsibility to this. And as Arkansas has always been sort of the uh, ground zero for for the problems and for the uh, the reactions on this. Another news report out of Arkansas from a group of farmers uh, who are basically soybean farmers have filed a petition. Uh, in response to the proposed April 15th ban on dicamba products. They are opposing the ban uh, that the dicamba task force is, is offering, saying they want access to the technology in season. Uh, this is a, a group of growers uh, who basically have key issues with the proposed ban. And here's what, here's what they're, they're saying that the restrictions would cause financial losses to farmers as alternate platforms for pigweed management are, <clears throat> excuse me, are not competitive with dicamba-based technology, that the task force is not representative of the majority of Arkansas farmers, and that producers' concerns were not adequately addressed, that pigweed is a major problem in Arkansas and the state should not be the only state in the South not allowed to use dicamba. They suggest a May 25th cutoff date and a one-mile buffer uh, that, that that date and that, that buffer would reduce or eliminate all injury that occurred in Arkansas in 2017. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see how things work out. Obviously, there's still an awful lot of opinions, awful lot of, uh, of feelings on this. And uh, as Beck mentioned, there's, we have an interview coming up with, uh, with Dr. Larry Steckel. I sat down with him several weeks ago. Uh, he's... Uh, he has some thoughts on, on, on where we might be where we might be going on this, but uh, uh, it's uh, safe to say no one has a, a specific solution, but that a lot of people are working to try to come up with one. Yeah, but you know, <clears throat> Larry has been great to cotton grower. I mean, that's two 
times within probably the past less than a month now that he has sat once with me and once with you right where he's taking time out of his day to kind of sit down and, and offer up his thoughts and he like us is in a position where he's got to be uh, by nature of his job um, fair to both sides and and lend an ear to both sides of this issue right and um, I can't remember if I was telling you or might, might have been telling him about it this is really the first issue since I came on board at Cotton Grower back in 2008 where to me it feels like uh, there are divisions within the farming community um, or maybe it's the most heated example that I can think of where I think it's one of the most extreme examples of how you can how you can break a community into you know a, just a, a break of opinions yeah on this yeah absolutely and and he and so anyhow I'm, I'm deviating from my original point here which is how even keeled Larry has been on this issue and when I interviewed him a month ago you know he he was <coughs> explicit in pointing out that you cannot talk about this issue without mentioning that he said there's two stories it's not just one there's right. not just the story of this conflict that has come out of this the use of this product or misuse of this product, depending mm-hmm. on what your opinion is, <clears throat> over the past year. He says, yes, that's certainly something that's happened and deserves the headlines that it gets. He goes, but also one that doesn't get as much headlines is the fact that these are the cleanest fields that he's seen here in this part of the state in maybe a decade. Ever. Yeah. He's like, you know, it's it, the fact is the efficacy of this product is unmatched. These growers need it, mm-hmm. and you know they deserve to have their story told too. And I think that's what you're seeing with these this group of, uh, I guess what you said, soybean guys over right. in Arkansas, Out of Arkansas. Mm-hmm. are saying the same thing. They say they say, you know, hold on for a second before we all lose our heads over this. We need this thing too. Yeah. You know, this is useful to us. So again, I, I have not listened to this interview that you got uh, with Dr. Steckel, and I don't want to be stepping on toes uh, on that. So, but I think I think the other factor in all this too is is we may start seeing a resurgence in or a changes in the way things are apl- are applied. You know, we may see more hoods in the fields yeah. next year. Um, obviously, things like the sea and spray technology uh, will be a huge benefit. But again, those are you know those are, are down the road. Uh, Got to look at some short term options on how to, how to successfully steward the product in the field uh, because again. The initial label from EPA is good only through the end of 2018, and uh, and it's one of the reasons they've been monitoring these situations so closely, and why now they're working very closely with with the state departments of agriculture to try to look for solutions to keep this product viable. Uh, EPA wants this product to stay on the market, and and they're looking for ways to make that happen. And again, keep in mind. This is not just a cotton-related issue. That other states in the Midwest, Illinois has had issues with it, Indiana, Minnesota, uh, any place where you've had corn and soybeans in the area, there's, there are still some situations there. Uh, and, and I guess the, the nice part or the comforting part about it is all of the weed scientists in all of these states are talking to each other and are working together and are starting dialogues with the manufacturers and EPA to look for solutions on this. Yeah, yeah. So we should probably reel it in. Uh, you and I could talk about it for a while here, or we could uh, introduce into the combo your interview with uh, the aforementioned. I think it's doctor. probably time. I'm sure people are tired of listening to <laughs> us. At this doctor, point. Doctor Larry Steckel. So we'll do that now. Y'all stick with us, and uh, on the flip side, we will bring you. Jim's interview with Dr. Larry Steckel right after this. Well, welcome back to the Cotton Companion. Uh, today we're in Jackson, Tennessee at the University of Tennessee uh, at the West Tennessee Experiment Station uh, for the University of Tennessee. They've had their, uh, their annual cotton field day today and we're, uh, we're visiting with Larry Stackel who's the Extension Weed Specialist for the University of Tennessee. Uh, Larry, thanks for joining us on Cotton Companion today. Oh yeah, I'm glad to be here. Okay. Uh, I think 
obviously we can we can sit back and say for the last couple of weeks maybe hurricanes have have taken some of the focus away from some of the other issues impacting uh, the market and 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 rightfully so obviously we've all seen the photos of, of South Texas and we're keeping our fingers crossed at this moment that Irma won't do any damage to uh, to our friends in the southeast uh, and although I guess herbicide season is essentially over at this point, uh, we're starting to move into evaluation time now on these new on the new herbicide technologies. Um, looking back and in, in, in some of our discussions, I'm sure you've had a fairly relaxing summer. Uh, as uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, looking at looking at this, uh, how many fields, how many acres do you have you covered this year? Taking a look at uh, at, at injury issues and, and other factors that might. Uh, might be part of, of the evaluation as we're moving ahead. Yeah, well, I looked at the first go round, which would have been through June and uh, into early July. It was, it was hundreds of fields and probably close to 35,000 acres um, that I looked at, mostly of soybean, but some there was a little bit of cotton and then just mm -hmm. a sundry of other vegetables and gardens wow. and such. And then late, we started getting into August, we got into another drift event in late July and uh, that into almost in early August was another almost 10,000 acres. Uh, most of those have been hit for the second time or mm -hmm. the third time, uh, some of those fields, and really took a lick. Um, and those were probably the most disappointing because they just don't have the calendar to work with to try and work out of the, out of the injury. And on top of that, some of the other crops, uh, like the tobacco we have, that's a terrible time to hit it, right, when it's, it's starting to top. Um, and they've already got all their investment in it up front, and it's a very expensive crop, and it's really heart wrenching when you go to go to those fields because uh, you can lose the contract just at the, just at the briefest glimpse of, right. of a cup leaf. It doesn't take very many parts per billion for that. No, though. very little, doggone it. So, um, it, it, you know, that's that's been very disappointing uh, going into that uh, as far as the drift events go. Uh -huh. um, I will say. Um, uh, on the enlist side, we had a fair amount of enlist cotton in Tennessee this year. Uh, the Dow folks tell me about 26,000 acres or so. And what was nice is it was very quiet. I had very few calls there. Um, and when I think back to last year, we probably almost had that many acres of extend sprayed, albeit with formulations that weren't labeled. Right. Uh, and we had 90,000 acres off target movement and it was very loud. <laughs> so I have some hope for the enlist system um, that it, it, it may have a lot less issues uh, mm -hmm. going forward. Um, so uh, I'm still the jury's out because I think a lot of this is scale. Um, when you're spraying large acreages and, and a bunch of farmers at the same time in a certain part of a county spraying large acreages, I just don't know if we don't get a scale effect. Uh, of it hanging in the air. So until we get that, and there's no way to test it <laughs> yeah. until you just go out and do it. So, uh, but yeah, it was a kind of a tale of two tapes uh, this year with, with that. Yeah, that was, I was going to ask you about that because that was one thing you mentioned out in the field, sort of like there's two, there's two, so, two definite stories involved in this. Let's talk about the weed control aspect because there were some good positive benefits. Oh yeah, clearly. And, and you know, uh, you know, I drive across the state repeatedly throughout the summer and we have as clean of pigweeds as we've been in 10 or 12 years easily. Um, so just very big upside um, and most of that was in cotton particularly was extend. I mean we're mm -hmm. 85, 90 percent extend and the rest was pretty much in list. So uh, really effective weed control uh, and I had, I've had a number of growers tell me this is the first year in a long time they haven't had to hire a chopping crew on top of their herbicide program. So a lot of positives. Um, you know, I showed a little bit of a survey today. I did, and one of the survey questions, I didn't have time to do it here, but to ask them is, is, is how much cost or savings did they get out of the, out of the extend system? And on average, they were, uh, uh, the estimate was $21 an acre, less herbicide cost, weed control costs. Um, so that's very significant. It's definitely, it's a good positive. Oh, there. a big positive, and you know, with margins so tight, you just, that's just such a huge positive. So, and so those things really look good. And the other thing is, you know, we're getting more and more into cover crops, and these new systems help us manage cover crops more effectively uh, to be a better weed control tool. So a lot of positives, and if just any way at all, we can keep these, these train on the tracks. Um, it's, it's so positive on the weed control standpoint, you just hate to see it get derailed by, by all the off-target issues. Right. Now, I know uh, here in the Mid-South, we've seen, uh, so far we've seen, you know, some states ban duck handle use. We've seen a lot of limited use options that come out during the uh, during the season. Basically, 
from our perspective, I look at it, there's a lot of questions that are out there searching for answers. Oh yeah. Right now. Yeah. Where where are we now as we're moving into as we're coming out of the out of the crop season into harvest? Where are we going to go from this point into next year, knowing that we've got one year left on this on this federal label? Well, to make it right, and uh, I, I'm an educator, not a regulator, and a lot of this is going to go to them. So, but uh, you know, I, I visit with those guys and been been trying to advise them as best I can on where we go. Um, you know, some of the things uh, that Tennessee did this year, some of the new regulations we put on there. Um, that was part of my survey questions to a lot of the retailers, and a lot of them thought if we'd had those at the get-go, we might have been a little bit better off than we mm -hmm. were on uh, some of those cutoffs. Um, so, you know, it, that's some things for them to mull over going into next year. Should they keep those those emergency rules or should they let them slide? Right. Uh, things along those those lines, uh, or should they re-pick them up? So that's, that's one thing. I think it, for the most part, um, I, I think the... Um, because they're emergency rules, they had go they go out of effect effect on July 11th, which is what they get a year, right. and you cannot reinstitute them. So mm -hmm. you got to go through a whole big process to reinstitute them. So uh, you got to go through uh, legislation, apparently. So uh, I'm learning all kinds of things from the regulatory point. I did not know. Um, so, but as far as uh, what Tennessee's doing in in a number of other states, quite frankly, are getting putting working groups together. Mm -hmm. I know Arkansas did, Missouri has, Indiana. Uh, and, and Tennessee as well, and um, basically it's, it's, it consists of growers, some who've been damaged by dicamba, some that are very pro dicamba, uh, also commodity groups, the soybeans and the cotton commodity groups are involved, Farm Bureau is involved, uh, and, uh, and the commissioner um, has asked them to uh, put the heads together and come up with some suggestions for, for next year. So they had that first meeting here last week, it was a very mm -hmm. productive meeting. Uh, where they had a bunch of folks come in, TDA came in to those farmers and kind of explained their process. Uh, University of Tennessee, uh, I, I was there, and Tom Mueller, uh, who does a bunch of research on, on volatility and, and um, off-target movement uh, research was there. He gave some talks to them, as well as Monsanto and BASF and DuPont, mm -hmm. they were there, and then also there some of the retailers, the co-op and uh, Helena and, and CPS. So they all had got input. Um, from from those groups and um, and they're going to get together sometime in mid October now, and probably come up with some kind of suggestion to give to Commissioner Templeton. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I hear most often mentioned is a cutoff date. Um, now Arkansas has got theirs, what their suggestion is, and where it'll go I don't know. April fifteenth. I know I've heard some folks mention like in Indiana talking about July. Um, so the devil's in the detail on where the date right. goes. Uh, and, and there's going to be some folks that want to, you know, I'm sure the Arkansas time, there's going to be some that want it well into July. Um, and they're going to have to come some, come some come kind of compromise in between. Mm -hmm. I know there was a, it was a pretty extensive education effort going into this year. Do you see those efforts continuing, changing, increasing as we move into next year? Because right now I think... As we, go, as we go back and look at the summer, it's like we've talked about, this is an option, this is a possibility, this is a possibility, but you can't put your finger on one thing. Uh, what, else, what else do we need to tell growers at this point? Well, that's, that's one of the issues is I don't think we can educate ourselves out of this issue. Um, I think we proved that last year. We did unprecedented education in this state. Um, so just, just my just my program, me and, and, and mm -hmm. graduate students, and then with some county agents, uh, we trained you know into the six thousands on, on on applicators and growers this past year at meetings all across the state um, on on best management practices for this technology. On top of that, they had to take um, modules that we put together. Everybody had to take it. They right. went through restricted use training and go through that test, and and we have the highest percent. Uh, of the folks that have gone through there to this point, it's like 80 some percent. Usually, we're not near that high. Um, that have gone through that training, they got till October to finish it. But uh, most of them did it in the spring, and that's unprecedented. So, and then that wasn't that isn't where it ended. BASF did some very effective training. Monsanto did some very effective training on top of that. So they got a lot of this two and three times. Right. So, I, I think the the problem is, I mean. Folks that wrote those labels, in my opinion, uh, not, not many of them sat in a tractor or in a in a sprayer and tried and tried to spray it. It is 
that is that is a hard thing to hit because they hitting the sweet spot on that. You look at the label. You got to spray pigweeds when they're four inches tall. Well, that's great. Mm -hmm. um, but then you also can't spray if the wind's below three or above fifteen, and you can't spray if the rain if it's supposed to rain in twenty four hours. Well, uh, Indiana they just did a quick survey in June of how you could hit that sweet spot. How many days you have in the month of June to be able to spray mm -hmm. in just that window? And it was like two hundred hours. <laughs> the, whole, the whole month. The whole month. To hit that. So logistically, you got a grower. It's got, you know, a couple thousand acres of soybeans and a couple thousand acres of cotton over three counties, which isn't uncommon. The logistics are right. Just, uh, are just well, it's it's a Herculean task to get it all done. So I think that's part of the issue um, in trying to get our arms around this is how do you even get around that? Um, and I mean. I don't know if you can buy more sprayers. I mean, that's about what it would take and more, more applicators to get around as timely as you need to. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as education, um, we'll do what we can next year. But, uh, my gosh, I just don't know how we could get, get more than we, we have this past year. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's, it's a fairly common thought any time a new, a new product or new technology hits the field. It's like by the time we get to year two, we're going to be a whole lot smarter about it. Uh, than we were going in on the, on the introduction year, and I'm hoping that will certainly be the case moving into next year with this, because you know there is a time limitation at this point. Oh, there is. We got it. Uh, I'm afraid the, sh the shelf life looks like it's 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 um, the end of next in next fall. Uh, so we're just not 12 months away now, mm -hmm. and uh, if we can't prove we can steward this better than than what we currently have shown, uh, it's going to sunset, and I don't think they'll pick it back up. I yeah. think we'll lose the label. Well, and I think the the, you know, the the encouraging thing at this point is we've got all the interested parties that are involved in this working together on it. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, yeah. I think so. Most everybody, I think, is trying to row in the same direction here. <laughs> um, so, and uh, you know, a lot of the growers, uh, guys, a lot of the folks. That, I mean, uh, it, it's such a mixed bag. Uh, most of them that drifted or thought they drifted on their neighbor they may or may not have it could have come from somewhere else but uh, you know felt so bad about it you know they quit spraying it uh, mm -hmm. they talked to a lot of them that did and started doing other things um, trying to clean up what weeds they had to later because uh, they didn't want to go through it again and, and um, so and I got other growers saying you know well I'm just going to go to another technology because I don't want to drift on my neighbors but uh, on the off other hand you got other folks that I'm going to just go extend because they're for, for defensive, defensive purposes. purposes. Yeah. So you hear all these different things and how it's all going to shake out is, is anybody's guess at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it's been an interesting year, that's for sure. Well, it looks like uh, looks like the fall and winter months are going to be just as busy as summer from, yeah. a, from a different perspective. Different perspective. So, and I don't, the, the retailers and uh, the farmers right now trying to de decide, because this is kind of the seed buying time of year, we're, we're, get, we're just starting right. to roll into it, of where to, where to place your orders. Should it, you know, um, you know, and you're going to have more choices next year in cotton. Clearly, mm -hmm. we're going to have uh, enlist and extend, and I think we'll see more of a mix of those two. And can they coexist in a mix? Uh, we had some farmers trying to use both technologies this past year, and they found it was kind of hard to clean out. Yeah. Uh, enlist in a sprayer and spraying dicamba and vice versa and then there was some issues uh, uh, where some some st wrong stuff got dumped in the in the sprayer so uh, those kind of issues we're gonna have to overcome when you're running dual technology platforms mm -hmm. I know uh, Arkansas had the uh, the flag the technology program is that something that you've adopted in Tennessee and if so how are growers using it this year yeah, oh yeah, we adopted it right right from the get-go when they, they started it. It's primarily what you saw was the lime green ones um, mm -hmm. uh, the, for the Liberty. And then, yeah, we got a number of those. You, you'll see them out spread around the countryside. Um, sometimes, though, I've seen them uh, uh, even uh, uh, strapped to, uh, uh, the, you know, the roadside department's uh, mowers tractors, too. <laughs> so I think they get borrowed at times. But, uh, but uh, yeah, those have been used very, very effectively, and they do help. They've mm -hmm. saved some fields, I know, firsthand. Uh, and more of that probably would be, be helpful for not pulling in the wrong field with the wrong herbicide. Right. Absolutely. Larry, thank you. I appreciate your time today. Uh, I know you've, you're still a busy guy as, uh, as, we, as, we, as we bring this crop uh, to the end of, uh, of this crop year. Uh, we appreciate your time. We'll check back in with you and visit again at some other point. Oh, it sounds good. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, this is Jim Stedman with the Cotton Companion. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.
So all right, that is going to just about do it for this installment of the Cotton Companion podcast. Uh, we want to thank Dr. Steckel once again for taking time to speak with us uh, once again. He is absolutely somebody who cares about the farmers uh, in his part of the world and doing right by them, and he is always willing to talk with us and very generous with his time when we ask him uh, for it. So we want to thank, thank him uh, especially. Uh, moving on, we are doing a new subscription drive, as you may have heard or noticed. Um, it's tied in part to our podcast platform. You may have already signed up uh, if you're listening to this thing. If you haven't subscribed to our e-newsletter or magazine in a while, it's very simple to do. Please visit cottongrower.com slash subscribe, and you can uh, give us your physical address where you'd like to receive the magazine. Give us your email address if you wish to receive our e-newsletter. And again, you'd be doing us a big favor. We, uh, we bring you what we think is good service journalism, great original content from cottongrower.com. All we ask in exchange is that you tell us how to deliver it to you. And again, we would sincerely appreciate it. Now, we uh, want to thank you genuinely for joining us today. If you like what you're hearing, by all means, Tell your farmer buddies about this podcast when you're hanging out, uh, having some coffee in the morning before you head out to your fields or the shop. You can get to our podcast, tell your buddies to get to our podcast in three easier ways uh, than what I have told you in the past. Because in the past where I've told you to go to Cotton Grower and search in the search bar for it, I've got an easier route for you. Go to cottongrower.com, simply add a forward slash companion in there so that you type into your URL bar cottongrower.com slash companion, and that'll bring you to a landing page that has archived uh, each edition, 31 now, uh, including this one, uh, edition of the Cotton Companion podcast. The second way is to subscribe to our channel on iTunes. If you're familiar with iTunes on your smartphone, just go ahead and subscribe to our channel. Uh, You can find it in the iTunes app. Simply type in cottoncompanion.com, the podcast's app, and uh, you will be able to find, subscribe, leave us a rating, let us know what you think we're doing well or we're doing wrong. We would love to hear back from you uh, and get your feedback. The third and final way, what I think is the best way for you to receive each installment of the Cotton Compendium magazine, is to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter. Jim here works hard to pack those e-newsletters with all the relevant news of the day, and uh, he Produces those things like clockwork. They hit your email inbox each Tuesday morning, occasionally on Thursday mornings at points during the production season as well. You can do that by going to the aforementioned cottongrower.com slash subscribe. And there you'll be able to uh, give us your email address and we can get those e-newsletters to you. Also, make sure you're following us on social media. We are at Cotton Grower Mag on Twitter. And on Facebook, you can find us by searching for Cotton Grower Magazine. We hope that you are enjoying your latest issue, which should be the August-September issue. Uh, The October one we just wrapped up this past week. It is due in your mailboxes around that second week of October, so be on the lookout for it. It is a special tabloid-sized magazine, so it'll be hard to miss. This podcast was produced by Mr. Mark Antonelli. He works at the Mothership Meister Media Worldwide in beautiful Willoughby, Ohio. My name is Beck Barnes, and I will be back with you in two weeks on the next episode of the Cotton Companion podcast. For now, on behalf of my own Cotton Companion, Jim Stebman here, we wish you and your farming operation all the best.